In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The second conference today is on the end of man. This meditation is the basic groundwork, not only of the purgative way and of the retreat, but for the whole spiritual life. St. Bonaventure tells us, For in guiding the mind in all things to be done or avoided, man should consider his last end. The souls, the elect, therefore, should always seek the purpose of their creation. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And that's from Genesis 1.27. In the Catechism, it tells us, Of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator. He is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake. And he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. It was for this end that he was created. And this is the fundamental reason for his dignity. Being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person who is not just something but someone. He is capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of freeing freely given himself and entirely into and, and entering into communion with other persons. And he is called by grace to a covenant with his creator to offer him a response of faith and love that no other creature can give in his stead. So God created everything for man, but man in turn was created to know God, to love him, to serve him in this world in order to be happy with him forever in the next. St. John Chrysanthem tells us, what is it that is about to be created that enjoys such honor? It is man, the great and wonderful living creature, more precious in the eyes of God than all other creatures. For him the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all the rest of creation exist. God attached so much importance to his salvation that he did not spare his own son for the sake of man. Nor does he ever cease to work, trying every possible means until he has raised man up to himself and made him sit at his right hand. This is such a beautiful statement by St. John Christen, a great doctor, the church father. He's just so... Man is the pinnacle of creation above the trees, the animals, nature. And only man can communicate with God. Only man was created for God. The creatures were created for man to serve us in order to help us to get to heaven. But man is so important that... St. Christian once again said, God attached so much importance to his salvation that he did not even spare his own son for the sake of man. Even the angels don't understand this, why God did this, and how special man is. That was part of the fall of Lucifer. He, he couldn't believe, they say, that why would God take the form of a human being? Why? Because angels are above the nature of human nature. So if anything, Lucifer would be like, why would he take a form like me, an angel? And so man is such a mystery, and a great mystery. And it's so important. Like I said, God even didn't, he didn't even spare his own son. So it is of great dignity then to serve our God, because that's what he created us for. So many people don't understand it. This is the biggest problem today, my friends, in the world, in the church. People don't know who they are because they don't know who God is. And they, today they've reversed everything. Where they say, in order to know God, we start with ourselves. That's, no, that's not the way it is. And that's why everyone is messed up. In order to know who we are, we have to know who God is. 
Why? Because we're created in His image, in His likeness. So if we want to know who we are, we have to know who, what image we're created in. And if we don't get this right, we get nothing right. And so nobody in their right mind, if they know who they are and the dignity of their human nature, how they were created by God, would ever be lost, would ever be uh, contemplating suicide, despairing. No one would ever, would ever think those things, but they don't know who they are. They don't know how special they are. They don't know how, who they were created for. Why were they created? It's the biggest question. You know, why am I here? Why am I suffering? We have to notice. So who is the Lord in whose service we are enlisted? It's the first thing we want to look at. You must serve Him of whom it is said, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And of His greatness there is no end. That's Psalm 145, verse 3. King David prayed, Who would not want to serve the Lord after beholding His greatness and seeing its own destiny? Thou art the Lord, high, terrible, a great king over all the earth. From Psalm 47. In the book of Wisdom, chapter 11 says, For the whole world before thee is at as the least grain of the balance, and as a drop of the morning dew that falleth upon the earth. Try to realize the marvelous gifts which God has endowed you by creating your body and soul. How many people don't even realize the gifts that God has given them? Most men don't even know what gifts they have from God. They don't contemplate it. They don't even consider it. So for God has not left you in the realm of a mere, a mere possibility, but He gave you existence, and He did this from His own goodness. For without any merit on your part, He gave you your being by bringing you forth from nothing. God created you in His image once again. Let us make man into our own image and likeness. How many times have you meditated in your life on what does that mean? What does it mean to be created in God's image and likeness? I guarantee you 99% of the people in the world have never even thought about it. It's important that we reflect upon this because we will see how blessed we are. We're not just a dog or a tree. St. Bonaventure tells us that, and I quote him, creating the soul God stamped it with memory, intelligence, and will. Those are the three faculties of the soul. Memory, intelligence, and will. By which the soul becomes in his own image. That's how we're in the image of God, through the faculties of our souls. Alright? He goes on. The reason is that the singleness of the soul represents the unity of God. And its three faculties refer to the persons of the Most Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are not three gods, but one God having three persons. In the like matter, the soul that is intellect, the soul that is will, and the soul that is memory do not make up three different souls. But there is one soul having three powers wherein the resemblance to God is brought out in a marvelous manner. That's the end of the quote. That's, that is awesome. And so, through these faculties, that's how we resemble God. One God, three persons. One soul, three faculties. Reflect then, my friends, upon your intellectual ability. In virtue of this mental faculty, the soul can know all things. Its scope includes the past, the present, and the future. Within itself, it somehow embraces the whole universe. It may even elevate itself to the infinite, to the knowledge of God Himself. 
So great is the capacity of the soul that no creature save God himself can fully satisfy its desire. This is such an important state. So great is the capacity of your soul that no creature save God himself can satisfy his, the desi his desire. It's so why are you searching everywhere else? If the only way you can fulfill the desire of your soul is to be in union with God, why are we looking everywhere else but God? Since the knowledge of the soul is able, once again, to extend itself to the infinite, likewise the soul affection, it can reach the infinite. The affection of the soul does not rest in temporal goods, which it surpasses in value, but in eternal goods, in God, in God alone. I want to repeat that. The affection of the soul does not rest in temporal goods, which it surpasses in value. They have a limited value on, but only in eternal goods, in God alone. You're God, you're, you were created for God and God alone. He's the infinite. And when you try to fill your soul up with finite things, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be at peace. That's the problem in the world. That's the problem in our lives. And to the degree that we're filled with God is to the degree that we'll have peace of soul, tranquility of soul. And we see in this world people are just filling their hearts up with temporal things, money, sex, drugs, alcohol, all material things that can never satisfy their soul. Never. It's only God alone can satisfy you. Because the soul was created to gain the highest good, which is God, therefore it must rest in Him and enjoy Him and Him alone. And because the soul was made to seek God, and since whatever else it seeks is less than God, therefore this lesser good will never suffice. It's simply because it is not God. For the desire of the soul will never be quieted except through that which fills it. Because there is always a lack of rest in that part of the soul where it is wanted in fullness. But according to its appetite, it is capable of possessing God. Therefore, since every created thing is infinitely less than God, it can never fill up the craving of the human soul. It's all from the holy doctor, St. Bonaventure. Since every created thing is infinitely less than God, it can never fill up the craving of the human soul. And that means human beings too. How many men make idols out of their wives, or their girlfriends? You'll never be satisfied. They can never satisfy your soul. Only God could. How many men are making idols out of money and houses, cars, and everything? It's never enough. Boy. So God gave you an immortal nature, an incorruptible substance, an unending existence, an eternal life. Otherwise, you would not be in the image of the eternal trinity if your life closed with the gate of death. Ponder the tremendous importance you enjoy in the sight of God. God created all things for you. Ha, ah, friend, for you. He created the mountains. He created the sun, the ocean, the stars. He created them for you. No other reason. So that when we look at the beauty of nature and all the created things, we should lift up our soul to God. But He created them as a, a means to an end, not to become an end in itself. God watches over you so carefully. He sought you out so entirely and redeemed you at such a great price. The Son of God descended from the heights of heaven to redeem you. And this is awesome. 
God is infinitely content. The Holy Trinity within itself is totally content, totally happy. And nothing without outside of the Holy Trinity can bring happiness to the Holy Trinity. So contrary to what we talk all the time, oh, make God happy. We can't make God happy. He's totally content within his totally, you know, happy God. Nothing can bring any extra goodness to him. And so that should bring, uh, it should blow us away when we meditate upon it because he didn't have to create you. He didn't create you for what you could do for him. You can't do anything for him when it comes down to it in the end. You can't bring any extra happiness to God. He only created you because he chose to. He created you just to share his love with you. St. Augustine said, God became man so that man may become God. St. Augustine also goes on to say that my heart will not rest, O Lord, until it rests in you. Because he realized, he chased the material world. He chased created beings. And it brought him nothing but misery and sorrow. So just think about it. You see, because we're humans. And many of us, most of our motives are never pure. When sometimes we help someone, we're helping them because we want something else from them. (laughs) That's not how God is. He chooses to love us just because He chooses. I didn't, you did not choose me. I have chosen you. And this is when we start realizing this, that God brought us into the world. What a gift. In In our life, we should want to glorify God and honor Him and serve Him the way He has revealed he wants to be served. That's the problem with, with the church today too. So many people say, oh, look at our church, our churches are empty. Totally empty. Every people go to, and the ones that go to church, they're bored. They say, I don't get nothing out of it. You're not supposed to go to church to get anything out of it. You go to church to worship God, the infinite you go to church to worship Him. So every, we got it all backwards. And that's why churches are shutting down left and right. Because people don't know who they are. They don't know why they're created. One diocese not far from here, they're going to shut 102 churches down within the next four years. 102 churches being shut down. And when they shut our churches down, you know what they do? They usually sell them to Protestants and all these other groups. And they give it away just about. You know, it's a shame because we don't know who we are, even as a church. It's horrible. So God loves us, then He creates us to be with Him. And He and, and He and He even made His Son die for us, and that's the price of sin. It's so horrible, sin. The price of sin is the death of our Savior. 1 Peter 1.18 it says. God will to buy you back with a greater price than your value required that you might better realize your own precious value from the stupendous price paid. That's how we judge things, people. What is it worth? Well, how much money is it? You know, That's how we judge the value of things. Well, what is your soul worth? You can't put a price on it. The blood of Christ, which is infinite. And that shows you your value. So, God puts us in the world and we're surrounded by creatures and worldly things. So we want to have self-control. Okay? And we want to have control. We want to use creatures in the proper way. We don't want them to become an obstacle for our, us obtaining union with God. We have no abiding place here on earth. We are pilgrims, my friends, going home. Created things, however beautiful and attractive, are not our end. They cannot satisfy the boundless longings of our heart. They are but a faint likeness of God's infinite beauty. Steps of the ladder which unites earth with heaven and by which we climb to God's throne. They are servants All things on the face of the earth are created once again for man's sake in order to aid him, okay, to obtain his end. 
which he has created for. They're means to an end, all right? Means to an end. Food, we need food because we need energy and we have to eat to live so we, you know, we can worship God, obtain our end. But when it becomes an end in ourselves and you give in to gluttony, you're misusing these creatures. But once again, we have to realize one of the most important things I said here too is that this is not our home. Do you think about heaven every day? Do you think about your end every day? Do you think every day when you wake up saying, this may be my last day. Am I on the way to heaven? And if you're not on the way to heaven, you're on the way to hell, my friends. There's no midway. There's no middle way. It's either heaven or hell. Do you contemplate that every day? Do you contemplate it? So all created things are first means to know God, the Creator, and the primal cause, and His infinite perfections. Like St. John of the Cross, when he would see a flower, he would go into instant ecstasy. Why? Because he would look at that flower and see such, the, such beauty. You ever look at flowers up close, they're so uh, complex, they're so beautiful, so detailed. And God made that only for one reason, so that you'll lift your heart up to Him. And that's what St. John would do. See that flower go into ecstasy, because God made that for me. That's a reflection of His beauty. A reflection of His beauty. Every created thing is a means to love God more and more. And so question yourself. The created things that fill your life, starting with your loved ones, your possessions, is this, are they truly a means that you are loving God more or are they taking you away from God? Study your life tonight. Go through your life. Go through the people in your life. Are you attached, inordinately attached to someone? Are you putting someone before God? Are you putting your possessions before God? Are you obsessed with your possession, your bank account? The first thing you wake up in the morning, are you grabbing the morning paper to see how much money you made in the stock market? If you are, your heart's not in the right place. Okay? These things are not helping you get to God they're bringing you away from Him so the whole meaning of life is the desire of God to take possession of man whom He has left free okay as mothers invite their children to their arms with sweets and playthings so does God attract us to Himself through His creatures and through so many gifts of His loving heart to love them is not sinful. It is sinful to love them independently of God. To stop at them instead of rising from their love to the love of God. So when a loved one of yours does something nice to you, don't just stop there. That should help you say, well, my wife, she just did this beautiful thing to me. It should lift your heart up to God then. It reflects the beauty, how much more God loves you even more than your wife or your children. Don't let it just end right there. Okay? It is simple, once again, to love them independently of God. To stop at them instead of rising from their love to the love of God. The good things of this world are given to us also to develop our activities as individuals, as members of a family. And as members of a family, as members of society, we must then take proper care of our body and its senses, and of our soul and its faculties, and that they reach the perfection which God requires it. So, my friends, I right now examine your kind. Are you taking proper care of the body that God gave you? Or do you abuse your body? All right? Are you abusing your body by eating, drinking things you shouldn't be eating, drinking, whatever? Do you take care of your health? Some people just say, I don't have to. No, that's not true. The body is sacred. It's the temple of God. Okay, so do you take proper care of your body, of your senses? Do you take proper care of your soul and its faculties? 
and that they reach the perfection what God requires of us. Purify your intellect. Strengthen your will. Guard your memory. You know, the good memory is fine. The bad ones, you know, watch it. But you want to do this. Some people, they, they abuse their intellect in a way because they start to begin that it's them. That they are so smart. But it's a gift from God. And then all of a sudden it ends with them. Intellectual pride, my friends, is one of the worst. Pride, it's one of the worst. It is the worst. And I've seen many, many smart men, theologians, they're so smart that they start to think that they're God. That they're above God. That's what happened to Lucifer. So you want to sanctify your intellect. So knowledge, just for the sake of knowledge, is going to lead you to hell. So many people, even in spiritual life, they just, they just love to devour books just so they could show off that they know so much about the spiritual life, but their soul's dead. Like he said to the Pharisees, you're like these white sepulchers. You look white on the outside, but inside you're dead. How many people study all this stuff for their intellect and, you know, because they want to correct the priest on his rubrics? I can go on and on about the intellect. But this is it. Your will. It's the scariest gift God has given each and every individual. A free will. Where you could either choose to serve God or not. He's not going to force you. He's not going to beat on you. And that's a scary gift. And it's the greatest gift that He's given you. And He wants you to surrender that gift back to Him. To surrender your will. I just spent two and a half, two days at a man's deathbed. A friend of mine's father, pray for him. His name is Antonio. He passed yesterday at 11 o'clock. And two days praying, his whole family at his deathbed. And I kept reminding him and telling him, whatever Jesus wants, unite your will with God. If you say yes, Antonio, if you accept your death, St. Alphonse says you will go straight to heaven. Because you surrender your will. And you give it back to God. You could go straight to heaven. And when he was able to talk, he, he would say, yes, yes, that's what I want. He said he wanted to go home. It's beautiful. Do you, are you willing to surrender your will to God? And we have to strengthen our will. You're only going to strengthen your will, my friends, by doing practicing penance, mortification. You have to practice temperance. And that's how you strengthen your will. You have to constantly tell your fallen nature, no, no. That's why St. Francis, my Holy Father St. Francis, used to call his body Brother Ass. He says, you got to whip Brother Ass once in a while. Get in line. Because it's stubborn. Wants to do his own, own thing. The jackass don't want to go where you want it to go. Well, you got to get in line. So you whip it a little. That's what our Lord says. No one enters the kingdom of heaven without doing violence to himself. So strengthen your will. Purify your intellect. So once again, we must then take proper care of our body and of its senses of all our soul and its faculties, and that they reach the perfection what God requires in it. God requires perfection from every one of us. We sell ourselves short, say, come on, many people less, come on. You really believe God wants you to be saying, yeah, He said so. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. He doesn't mix His words, oh Lord. It's not like the nonsense we hear today. So, in, you know, everybody talks in such a convoluted way, from the pulpit especially. Meanwhile, the Lord said, let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Okay? Let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. He wants us to be perfect. He's not joking. Are you taking that serious? Are you striving for perfection? Your family has to... You're the leader. As you go, your family's going to go. 
The sins of a father are handed down three to five generations. And it's true. I hear confessions. Whoa. It's true. You'll just see a son falling in the same sins of a father. If a father's having problems with pornography, masturbation, all that stuff, that your life, the son's doing it. That's your life. So God wants us to be perfect. And beg Him. So say even we had to pray. When we talk to God in prayer, say, Jesus, You called me to be perfect. I can't do this on my own. I need extraordinary graces. Blessed Mother, Your Son wants me to be holy and pure like You. I can't do that on my own. I need Your grace. I need humility. Humility, number one, we acknowledge who we are, what we are, nothing. But if your intellect's filled with pride, you don't think that. You think you could do all things on your own. That's not the way it is. So we must work for the spiritual and the material welfare of the family or of the institution we belong to. We must not forget that we are members of a divinely instituted society, the church and of a large human society, the state. And it is our duty to work for the good of both according to the means which God has placed at our disposal. And that's why, my friends, you're not only individual, you make, part of, you make up part of society. And that's why there's two judgments. When you die, when Antonio died yesterday at 11 a.m. in the morning, Jesus Christ came in His glory and judged him. He had to be judged by an individual because he was an individual. And then on the judgment day, the final judgment, when Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead, then we'll be judged as a whole, as society. Because our actions affect others. When we do good, it affects the body of Christ. When we do bad, it affects the body of Christ. I had a talk with someone yesterday who was a communist. <laughs> and the poor soul, he was, he was telling me, ripping into me about the church. Your church is corrupt. I said, sure it is. So that's no news to me. Uh, not the church, the church itself, pure virgin, virgin bride of Christ. But the members, yeah. Those cardinals in the Vatican, those, yeah, I said, they're corrupt. Matter of fact, uh, St. Christian says the roads and the walls ahead of of hell, the roads and the walls of hell are paved with bishops. And so I, he was like kind of shocked I was admitting that. I said, sure, I agree with you. So what? You know, God's not going to judge you, uh, uh, compare you to the cardinal, the bishop, or me as a priest. He's going to judge you, do you look like his son? You know? People are so blind in the sin, the man goes on to tell me, and this is where blindness comes in, that we have to, in society, we have to love each other. And there should be no religions or no government that force you to do things and force you to do, go against your will. I say, oh, you mean like communism? <laughs> you know? He didn't even see it. He didn't even see it because when we commit sin, our intellect gets blind. And when we give in to sin, not only does our intellect get blind and it gets darkened, but our will constantly gets weakened and weakened and weakened. And so it's so important that we, we strive for perfection, help build up the church. Why is society in the, in the shape that it's in today? Because the church is in shambles. Why are we living in a government that's about to collapse and fall? Because we haven't listened to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We don't listen to Our Lady of Fatima. The consecration hasn't been done. <laughs> We're in trouble. So when we streak, seek for perfection, and it's true, it's sad, because this poor man, he was scandalized by so many things in the church. But I had to remind him what our Lord said. Woe to those who cause scandal. But nobody likes to hear what he said after that. He also says, woe to those who are easily scandalized. Easily scandalized. 
So my friends, take this serious. Beg our Lord this weekend to show you, to remove these obstacles that are preventing you from reaching perfection. First of all, the first step to becoming a saint is to desire it. Do you have that desire? You can't become a saint if you're not going to desire it. Just like if you want to become an Olympic champion, track star say, if you don't have the desire, you're going to become a track star. He won't even be able to walk, run a block probably, or half a mile. So how are you going to do it? You have to have the desire. Beg for the desire to seek perfection like the saints did. And that desire consumed them. Lastly, some creatures are means in God's love and providence to afford us matter for the exercise of self-denial and the practice of patience. These are the pleasures and the satisfaction that God forbids to all or to some of us and the sufferings which are inevitable to our state of life or which God sends us. And this is, this is such an important thing. So God, once again, used some creatures are means in God's love and providence to afford us matter for the exercise of self-denial. So these things that we come into our life that are not bad or evil, everything God created, created good, but they're means for us to deny ourselves. All right? They're means for us to, to exercise this self-denial or patience. There may be someone you work with that drives you nuts and, you, and God's saying, no, this person is a gift to you. Your boss is a gift to you even though he's on your case every day because I'm giving you a chance to exercise virtue here. That if I didn't put this man in your life or permit him to be in your life, you, may, you won't grow in holiness. Do we see it like that? And that's how we have to look at these crosses in our lives sometimes. That this cross is the means of salvation. That God's purifying. He sends you what you need. He carves a cross to your shoulder. It fits custom fit. He sends the humiliations that each of us need. Your humiliation is going to be different than your neighbor. Do you even realize that that's what's going on in your life? That when someone comes up to you and, 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 you know, and, and this person drives you crazy, start thinking, say, why is this person driving me nuts? And you're going to find that if you really pray about it, God may reveal to you why. Because you're filled with pride or whatever. Who knows? But he, he's sending that person there to chip away at the vice that you have. You know? It's like anything else. If you want to, you want to, you want to body build, you got to go in the gym. You have to exercise. So, so many people say they 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 pray and uh, overcome their pride, and then they start complaining. They get humiliation after humiliation. So, well, how else are you going to become humble? You got to be humiliated. Not the ones that you choose, but the one that God chooses. So He will send these creatures in your life. It gives you a chance to practice patience, to grow in it, to overcome your anger, your rage. Okay? Material things. It could be food, too, that you have an inordinate attachment. So he, 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 okay, gives you a chance to overcome that now. But do it for the love of God. If you're going to do it for yourself, it's not going to work. But if you do it, say, I'm going to do this because I love God and I don't want to be attached to this creature. It's going to help you get to heaven. So once again, these are the pleasures and the satisfaction that God forbids to all or to some of us and the sufferings which are inevitable to our state of life or which God sends us. Now I want to talk about the wrong use of creatures. To use the good things of this world merely for the pleasure they afford, to embrace them against God's will, and to shrink from what is hard and painful when duty commands otherwise, is disorder and sin. It is to do violence to create creation, to make it, in the words of St. Paul, subject to vanity, 
to force it into the servitude of corruption and make it groan and travail and pain. It is to make created things the instrument of our corruption and debasement. We belong to our belongings and become like the things which we love. And let me repeat that. We belong to our belongings and become like the things which we love. And that's horrible. Because when our possessions take possession of us, we're serving a creature that's below us. We become enslaved. And we're turning away from the infinite good and the infinite good and turning to the finite creature. It's horrible. You know, it's like saying, you know, money's the only thing that people understand. It's like saying, okay, you know, would you want a dollar or a, or a billion? I'll take the billion. Huh? There's no comparison between a billion dollars and one dollar, right? Well, that's such a bad analogy when it comes to choosing God over a creature. I mean choosing a creature over God, excuse me. The danger of being carried away by the love of created goods, forgetful of God, and of pursuing, pursuing creatures instead of the eternal, is only too great for such weak and blind great, uh, creatures as we are. Therefore, we must make ourselves indifferent that's a big word, indifferent to all created things in so far as it is left to the choice of our free will and is not forbidden. Acting accordingly for our part, we should not prefer health to sickness. That's a tough one. We should not prefer health to sickness. We should not prefer riches to poverty honor to dishonor or long life to a short one and so in all things we should desire and choose only those things which will best help us attain the ends for which we are created God's holy will must be the supreme rule that guides us both when we choose and when we reject anything when we say yes and when we say no so when your child is begging you for something and won't let up, I want the iPod, I want the iPod, and finally you get fed up because you don't want to hear them, no, 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 no. You have to make sure that you're choosing this for God. What does God want here? Okay, what's God's will concerning this? How many people, uh, God's the last one they consult, the last one they turn to? So many people tell me that, I, oh, I hate it over here. The church is all filled with all liberal heretics, priests, and, and you know, I moved out here. I said, well, when you moved here, did you check about the churches? What kind of churches were there? No, it, was a, it wasn't even on the list. They checked the schools. They check. They go down the whole checklist, the restaurants, the, the, the theater, blah, 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 everything. The, but the church wasn't even on the list wasn't even on the list once again God's holy will must be the supreme rule that guides both but guide us both when we choose and when we reject okay it's not just about choosing things also about rejecting things okay when you're about to do something you hear that voice telling you no no what do you you think that's you you want it and the voice is saying no it's trying to stop you it's probably your angel you say does God really want this for me is this is what I'm about to do is this going to help get me to heaven if I re refinance now and buy a bigger house just to make my wife happy because I can't take her no more nagging is this going to help get me to heaven whatever the situation is. But that has to be the number one priority. For most people's priorities, can I afford it? <laughs> you know, is this going to break me? Not about, does God want this for me?
Man is essentially and wholly for God. God alone perfects him. God alone is the proper object of his aspirations, his last end, and his eternal resting place. By seeking only his pleasure in created things, in opposition to God's holy will, man makes himself unfit for the eternal beauty and the eternal good. And the creatures which should have been his ladder of ascent to God become his ladder of descent into the abyss. And that's why in the gospel, what do you think our Lord warns us for? That it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is our Lord talking about? Does he mean that in a literal sense? What it means is in, in Jerusalem at that time, the, the wall that protected the city would be closed, the big gates, so that the enemies at night couldn't get in. So if somebody had to come into town at night, into the city, they had to go to the eye of the needle. And the eye of the needle was a very small doorway. I, don't, I forgot how high it was, very small though. And what would happen is they would come with their camels. For the camel to get in, they would have to strip the camel of all their belongings, you know, the saddle and all the things they were carrying. Otherwise, the camel couldn't fit through the eye. So that's it. Unless it's easier for the, eye, the camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a rich man. So he's telling him the rich man has to strip himself like the camel to get in. Because I don't care who you are, it's very rare that you can meet someone with money that's not attached to it. It's possible. We had great saints in the church, queens, kings that weren't attached but it's very, very rare. And that's why great saints like St. Francis, who was known as the Pavarella, he loved poverty. He embraced it joyfully because it freed him and it made it easier for him to attach his will to God and then to seek God alone. Because, you know, you know maybe someone here right now is saying, man, I should have had... Uh, Today is Friday, you know, so you can't eat meat. So, you know, let's have shrimp or lobster, you know, and you may be, you know, well, it could be a million things. It could be a million things. But the bottom line is pray this weekend that God, we all have something in our life that we're attached to, all of us. I remember St. John of the Cross talking about. I don't know if it was him or someone else that was attached to a rosary. He told me, God, you know, you can't be attached to anything. You can't be attached. He said, because it's like a little bird, he said, that has wings and can fly. And he says, but what happens is it has a little piece of thin thread on his leg. And every time he goes to take off, the thread holds him down to the earth. And he could pack it and break it, but he doesn't know. He doesn't do it. So that keeps holding him down. It's the same thing with anything we attach him. John, of course, says even that much of a rosary. And, and you laugh, but I, in religious life, say, you know, you don't own possessions. But it happened to me once with a rosary. And I thank God I remember that story. So I was down in, in Mexico in a very poor, poor convent. And I was there helping these nuns for a couple of weeks. And... So I, I would pray, you know, I was praying my rosary. And so right before I'm leaving, this nun come up to me and she had, I didn't know, but she had her eye on my rosary. And it was a rosary that I, 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 was, I didn't realize how I was attached. It was, it was really nice. Nothing fancy, but I just loved it. And she goes, oh, Page, can I have that rosary? And I wanted, I, t I wanted to tell her to get lost. And she begged me for it. She goes, oh, I'll give, here, I'll give you my rosary. So she gives me this piece of junk of plastic different colors, red, white, all kinds of times. Like, and I really didn't want to give her to mine. Mine was made of these, uh, by these monks of Job's Tears. That's a, a seed. Had a beautiful Benedictine cross on it. And, but, you know, I thought of St. John of the Cross, and I said, oh, so I gave it up. But obviously, I still think about it <laughs> once in a while. I said, I wish I had that rosary. So the whole point is we laugh about things like that. And when I was in the Vichy, I remember my superior telling us in class, he goes, 
talking about things like this, he goes in religious life, and I, we lived a very strict life of poverty. He goes, you better watch it, you'll get attached to a pen. And you know what? He was right. Because then you give everything, the more you give up, you know, the devil's always trying to get you, so, you know, always try to go against those things. Always try to deny yourself. But don't do it for yourself. Do it for Christ. Do it because you love Him. Say, I, want to, I don't want to get attached to this creature because I want to be attached to God. And so I hope this, this is a good way to start off the, the weekend, that you have enough to meditate on these things tonight. And I'm sure, like I said, when you pray to God, He says He'll give you a heart's desire in the Scripture. So if your heart's desire, and I'm sure it's good, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I know you came here because you want to be here, and that's a beautiful thing. So our Lord, guarantee, is going to speak to your heart. And just listen. And when, he's, when you start thinking he's saying something, especially something that's rubbing you the way, wrong way, <laughs> it's a good chance, you know, St. Paul says, discern all spirits. But be open. Give him free control. Say, do whatever you want with me, Lord. My will is yours. I surrender my will totally to you. Okay? Do with me whatever you will. Show me what you want, and he will do it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. We give you thanks, oh my God.